Good afternoon, viewers, and once again, welcome to another edition of uh, Practical Business Skills um, that are handled to us through the coach, Enterprise Uganda, and experiences of real business people. You know, to us who are announcing ambitions of joining business or those that are already in business, it is once again a chance for us to hear the experiences or the experience of uh, another very interesting person. I will delay that uh, for a minute or two. Once again, I need to say that I'm Charles Bodge, your host for this uh, evening. And uh, with me again is our coach, Charles. Happy so much to be here again. Uh, and good evening, viewers. Good evening, Ugandans. I'm so delighted to be having this Sunday afternoons with you. Very good. Now, our topic this evening is going to be on how to transform, like I'm sure some of you have seen the promo already, a tiny clinical laboratory to a world-class internationally accredited modern laboratory. So um, our commitment um, is to bring you as many experiences as possible because we know that so many of us are sitting in different you know, sectors. We have different abilities. Um, from where we can actually anchor our business aspirations or our interest in starting businesses. And <coughs> one of the areas uh, that, Charles, I think that has come out quite clearly mm. in our previous episode, because this is our seventh episode, actually, mm. is uh, you can actually transform that profession, the skills that you got from school, and clothe them, tool them to actually become your business. And that is one of the areas we'll be looking at uh, this uh, afternoon or evening. Now, uh, we have a special guest. I will allow him to introduce himself. You're most welcome, sir. Please greet the viewers and you. introduce yourself to them. Good evening, our viewers. Um, Stephen Kimba Kagwa, the laboratory director, Ebenezer Clinical Laboratory. Okay. Very good. Um, Viewers, uh, you've heard it from the horse's mouth himself, uh, Ebenezer Laboratory. He's going to tell us his experience. But before we go into that, Charles, um, mm. first of all, I would like to pick your mind on why today's topic is very important to mm. a person listening out there. But before we go there, mm. last week we had a very interesting case, mm. a very interesting entrepreneur. Mm. And I wanted us to start a discussion mm. by just you know, going through a brief mm. uh, a summary of the key learnings from the experiences of that entrepreneur mm -hmm. we had last week for the purposes of those that probably missed that discussion. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Charles Bogi, and uh, I'm happy to have uh, Mr. Chimba here today. But viewers, I want to tell you that um, Enterprise Uganda has been around for the last 20 years. Mm. During those 20 years, we have built businesses that run now to the level of 120,000. Yeah. But as, as we bring you examples of what we have done in the last 20 years, I want to again start by just making quick remarks, then giving a summary of what happened here last week. Mm. My quick remarks for today are running like this. After many of you watched what has been going on attend TV every Sunday afternoon. Four things that I just want to bring out today. One, there is a lot of capital to start a business out there. Mm. The money that we wait <coughs> from government is nowhere comparable to the money we already have as individuals, as salary earners, as people who own resources in the village in town. I was given a very important call last week by a very professional person, an auditor working with a reputable firm, he told me, oh, Chichi, after listening to the story of a young girl who did pharmacy and went on to start a first pharmacy, and by the time she was coming here after four years, she had three branches of the pharmacy and a medical center. Mm. And he said, Mr. Chichi, that is my key learning. He said, we have enough money as salary earners to start businesses, but we have enough excuses to stop that journey from starting which was extremely, I found very useful indeed. The second point I want to share with the viewers is that uh, the art of borrowing, getting loans, is one of the most difficult to master. And it's most difficult because when you begin to succeed, mm. every bank loves you. 
and they stop being cautious on how to learn you with responsibility. They just want you to take the money because you are among the best op opportunity for them to hit their targets. Now, you've been looking for loans when you were beginning and nobody wanted to give you. Now, the banks are doing the other way around. They are chasing you with good money. <laughs> Please take the money. Mm. Take the money. And I thought this was a very fundamental thing that's beginning to come out. And we had that experience in the story of Adieri that I will be covering later on. That's right. Number three. No matter the level of success of a person, every entrepreneur deserves and should get mentorship and continuous training. Mm. There is no saying, I have got a PhD in education like we normally do, and there is no any other thing you can do other than getting another PhD. Mm. But in private sector, the game of learning is continuous. You stop that, mm. rusting must come for you, and that rusting will wipe you out of the game quickly. I bring these preliminary comments because these Sundays are fundamental to you, the, the viewers. They are fundamental to this country because there are two things that we learn from these Sundays. One, that there are Ugandans doing things that really inform the journey of becoming an entrepreneur. And these Ugandans are within our own communities, our own relatives, and we need to appreciate them and not just take them for granted and say, you know, Yuga Chick is a big sort of success. There are ingredients inside that story that we're refusing to learn, and these Sundays are bringing them out for us to pick. But number two, apart from learning from the stories that we bring in here, one thing people need to know that all the candidates we're bringing here have had an interface, an interaction with a public institution called Enterprise Uganda. Mm. We are your agency where we give you ready-to-use skills, advice on how to run your business and run it successfully. So this others should, give in, should begin to give you hope that this country has got <coughs> an entity, an institution that does deliver solutions that work and work across the board. Whether you're in the village, whether you have a PhD, whether you have not spoken any English word, we will train you until you become a successful entrepreneur. Now, very quickly to the story of Adieri, mm. or uh, Omala. Omala came here, and many people just knew her as Adieri or, or Cheers. But a few things that came out of her story are the following. Number one, you need to focus and get known for a particular business. Then you can use that profile to launch into many other things. Adieri went into maize milling. She was into fruit uh, uh, packaging, agroforestry, poultry, wholesaling, exporting. But she was all the time known as Mama Cheers. Yes. Mm. Get known for something. And that will be the door opener for you wherever you go. Oh, Mama Cheers, what do you want to discuss with us today? Oh, I've come talk about seedlings. Point number two that came out of Adieri's story was... Do not use your humble beginnings so or your humble background as an excuse for poverty. Don't do it. A dairy worked in a rural shop of a brother, worked in a rural farm of a brother. A dairy stopped in senior four. But the dairy we know today has received several awards. She's a honorary doctorate holder. She's a woman of substance award for Africa. She was deemed best employer by Uganda Investment Authority. And this year, she has been lined up and she's already in the top 10 women across the globe with the most interesting women, woman entrepreneurship journey by a UN agency called Anctad. And the final selection of the top four will be done in November. Mm. But just by becoming in the top 10, it tells you that very, you, very what you, you'd call basic background, mm. it's up to you to return it and make it something great. Number three, we also learn from Adieri that do not expect many people <laughs> to believe in your vision. 
But you need to have faith in yourself to see the realization of that vision. A dear sat here and said, I was working with a friend in a Kampala suburb. Mm. And she was telling the friend, one day I will own a big factory. And the friend laughed and said, you, we are here working. We can't afford a taxi. <laughs> and you are hoping to get a factory? Yes. We are here. We want to eat lunch. Mm. We are hungry. We can't afford lunch. And you are here telling us that you want to become a owner of a factory? She said, please, when people speak, don't quarrel with them. They don't know what's going on in your head. You have a vision, and that vision, according to Adir, was making her sleepless. Mm. She stuck to it. But then Adir did not just have a vision. She actually woke up and started putting the baby steps into that vision. Mm. Putting it in action, not it's just a Not wish. just dreaming. Mm. And that takes me to point number four about Adir's story. She said, invest in yourself. Not just at the beginning of the journey. Invest yourself at the beginning, in the course of the journey, when you are at the peak of the journey, when things are turning down, keep investing in, your, in yourself. Adieri said, when she began to make great strides, somebody said, there is an institution called Enterprise Uganda. You need to go and attend their trainings. She came in humbly and signed up and closed a whole week attending our training. But after that, she, has, she continued attending other aspects of Enterprise Uganda's products. But not only did she keep coming to the training for business skills, she has also continued to get training for other technical skills. Mm. Invest in yourself as an entrepreneur. Number five, as you do all this, Adieri said, it's important to have mentors. Those few people, three, one, two, that you trust, that you feel you can confide in and say, you know what, yesterday I was having this issue in the business. I had this chat with my bank manager. This is now what's going on in my life. I can't share this with everybody else. But with you, I can come to you, confide in you, and get your views. Adieri said she had the executive director of UIA, Maggie, as one of her mentors. She also had the executive director of Enterprise Uganda as one of her mentors. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, she said she also had to enlist the support of family and the husband. This is a key because the journey of an entrepreneur, much as we admire them from outside, they work with a lot of issues and challenges in those stories of success. Number six, Adir Sore came up with another interesting observation. She said, challenges are part of doing business, but keep moving. Why? Luck tends to meet those already sweating on the road. Luck does not seem to say, oh, you have been crying too much in the bedroom and cursing yourself. Suddenly, somebody is coming to rescue you. As challenges are all over you, get out, open that door, go to that business premise, call that customer, talk to the customer. Along the way, opportunity will come in and will support you. Yeah. Adieri had issues to do with farmers, and some of those challenges, she couldn't solve them herself. Mm -hmm. Abitrust came in and found her in the field. And Abitrust said, this is interesting. <coughs> we can help you with this. COVID comes in and begins to affect her own mangoes. Yuri says, we can temporarily give you some support. Come to the center as we wait for a more permanent solution. Very key observation there as well. Mm -hmm. On Bubu, this by Uganda, build Uganda. Adieri's submissions were very interesting. She said, government should look at the entire value chain in agro-commodities. Don't just imagine that Adieri is going to pack juice and then force people to buy Ugandan juice at the end of the game. Mm. There are a lot more things that need to be done mm. to end up with a packed juice. Mm. And she illustrated so many things, especially working with farmers and assisting farmers to become good suppliers. And she said... It's important for government, if it treasures farmers as roses. She said, if you love roses, be ready to cope with thorns. With the thorns, yes. <laughs> now, if you love your, your, your villagers, your farmers, mm. Mr. Government, please assist these people who pick the things from those farmers to do a good job with the farmers, training them, 
giving them skills, giving them uh, encouragement and technical support. Mm. All those are not things that an investor like Adieri can do on her own, mm. but government needs to be part of that story. And in fact, she even said, it's important even when government does support some of these people using seedlings, don't delay to pay. Mm. Those delayed payments are removing capital from a big influencer or transformer like Cheers, and in the process, we are affecting the farmers that you love. I'm sorry. So government needs to support and be part of such stories like Adiere's story. Mm. The second last point she came up with was that entrepreneurship is not about luck and it's not about genes. She said she has gone through stressful experiences. If it was genes, genes would have just said, no, this one can't stress you because you are born to be this. She said she was a normal, natural person. She suffered stressful circumstances. And some of this could have wiped her out. So she cites the need to keep focusing on your vision, remaining a learner, and having your self-belief as some of the things you must be prepared for. If you just think, I think I'm born an entrepreneur, mm. and you miss some of these elements you brought out, you won't last long. Finally, uh, on loans. Adieri had a lot of cash flows coming from di different businesses. Along the way, those businesses were giving the banks a good impression of her bank account. Mm. And they said, please, Adieri, when can you come and borrow? We know you. Come and borrow. The lady said, ah, by the way, hostels are becoming a big thing now. I want to invest in a hostel. The bank said, excellent. Don't just invest in one, two, two. <laughs> <laughs> she, big, two big <laughs> ones. Two big ones. <laughs> she went and produced the two biggest hostels. Mm. And indeed, her story was up there. Mm. But behind that were less than assessed aspects of that borrowing. Adir had no experience in running a hostel. Adir had put 100% loans into starting an, a hostel. In her own words, she said those were key errors. Where you are raw, where you are inexperienced, then talk, don't take a loan there. Mm. Where you are low, where you are inexperienced, if you are to touch it, let the loan be a very small component. Touch it with your own money first and pick up the experience there. I just thought this was such a brilliant submission from an entrepreneur that we do not tend to listen and hear such detail mm. from. But this is what happened. When the hostels were eating up Adieri, Adieri made some fundamental decision that many of us who are borrowed tend to delay to do. She said, the thing is going nowhere. My other businesses are suffering. They are closing. And I'm going to make a fundamental decision and I'll live with the decision. She put the two hostels on sale herself. Mm. Now, many of us wait until the bank has knocked and knocked and knocked. Even the credit officer who did the assessment of your loan has been dismissed, but you're still hanging on making the final decision. Mm. Adieri made the decision and said, I'm putting them on the market. I'm selling them. They got sold. When they got sold, she reached out of the loan of over 7.9 billion, which later the hostels paid off, she remained with a tiny 100 million shillings. <laughs> she said, I will tuck my tail and with humility start with 100 million shillings and go back to my old dream of going for a fruit factory. As it were, the rest is history. Today, Adir has a mega farm in northern Uganda with 3,000 acres receiving visitors of all categories who are saying this is the kind of a farm that deserves not just community support from the leadership of the north but probably from the highest level of this country because the potential for that satellite intervention by here in northern uganda could transform the entire northern uganda in terms of selling fruits but fruits that go and get value added and after value addition, they serve the country, and we begin to have an export. That was the story of Adieri, and those were the comments I wanted to remind people who missed last week's episode, mm -hmm. that these Sunday afternoons are for you. Learn from real Ugandans, and believe that 
there is an organization in this country supported by the Minister of Finance and also this particular Sunday afternoons we are in joint partnership with Uganda Insurance Association to bring these testimonies to you. Very thank good, you. very good. Very powerful there, Charles. Thank you. And I think, uh, I like the way you summarize this. Um, mm. I mean, it's quite amazing. It is. But, mm. you know, I was humbled yeah. by, um, and it's something that I think a number of Ugandans have had or could associate with. Yeah. You know, when everything else turns against you, yeah. <laughs> and the only decision you have to do is mm. to get back to the to the roots. To the roots, yeah. As they say. In right Uganda yeah. they say <laughs> Kuda <mcharo. laughs> eh? There's even a song. Yes. Something <laughs> like that. <Yeah. laughs> now ideally went on wire. Yes. That took a lot of courage, I would imagine. A lot. Yeah. And I think um, the number of learnings that someone can actually get from mm. there. But I think mm. it came because of the mentorship. True. Because uh, some True. of these decisions, you don't make them by, yeah. uh, you know, just accident or just a revelation or something of that sort. Mm. I think the mentorship was quite fine. Well, and just that point, uh, just before yes. you move to our guest here. Yes, yes. There are many Ugandans who watch a store of success and they are looking for that one moment mm. when they will slip off from the tra trajectory. Yeah. And their desire is to assess and malign and darken the story. I hear you. So, when you really jump from that level of considerable success mm. to now a moment when you are saying, am I still the same person? The people around are celebrating yeah. and saying, that is it. She had left us behind. That is it. We knew. We knew. It is sad. So but that mentorship is, is key. Yes. And having a center or an institution or an, an, a person you believe in yeah. to go and just say, this is my dark story. Where do I go from here? Very powerful. Very important. Viewers, mm. you can be part of this discussion already, even before we open the calls. We have a number on the screen. An Airtel number, you can uh, drop us a WhatsApp and you can start to pick, mm. you know, those uh, questions, those pointers, those comments. Uh, the coach is here and our entrepreneur is in the house. And I think this is a time when we hear from Mr. Chiemba. Yes, please. Um, I know you gave us a brief introduction about you. But I'm sure Ugandans would like to know in full, what do you do? What business are you involved in? Uh, <coughs> we are involved in a service delivery industry offering clinical laboratory services at Plot 1, Bombo Road, Shore House. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um... Clinical laboratory services for those uh, involves getting patients, usually referred by doctors. We take samples from them, blood, stool, urine, or anything, mm. even biopsies. These are the pieces of meat which are obtained from the patient when they undergo surgery. We examine them, make our findings, and report to the doctor. Then the doctor is guided on how the on the guided on the decision is going to take of managing the patient i hear you now when did you go into this line of business when did you start um i'm a trained medical lab technologist yeah and uh, during those times of Idi Amin, when i just qualified mm -hmm. uh, it was difficult for people to for certain earners to earn anything and for beginners were still young I decided to go across to Kenya, and I worked in a private clinical laboratory where I discovered that one can actually start a private laboratory, a standalone clinical laboratory, and offer service, one self be in self-employment and employ others. Mm. So while we were there, I used to, I developed that idea. Mm. And when things stabilized here, I realized when I came for uh, to see what was happening when the NRM took over, I thought I could come back and start a service. And uh, one of the most important things that uh, made me act that way, we used to have many Ugandans mm. coming to Nairobi 
for the basic laboratory services. At the time when you were in Nairobi? At the time when I was in Nairobi. Mm. You'd find that, uh, well, I also worked in Nairobi Hospital. You'd find that the, do the patient, a Ugandan, comes to Nairobi Hospital. He's seen by a Ugandan doctor. About 80% uh, of the doctors in the casualty were Ugandans. Then he comes to the lab. He's attended to by Ugandans, mm. who are about 50%, and holding the top positions in the laboratory, different disciplines. So I said I could come back because I knew there were very many other people who could not afford to go to the window to get that foreign money to move to Nairobi. Mm. So I decided to... The window. I know a number of people may not really yes. get what you mean. The window. <laughs> oh, at that time, I think yeah. the Bank of Uganda yes. was selling dollars or foreign exchange Yes. at certain windows. I think there was a commercial one. And yes. Then one mm. Window one, window two. Uh -huh. That is correct. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So that's where the, wind, the, the nani used to come. At, at that time, this uh, Kivanda business had not started. That trading must have in been money. tough, eh? To yes. go into that window yeah. and get <laughs> the money and all you that. You had to be screened by a uh, professional body to qualify you to go and ask for foreign exchange so that you could go for the treatment. I hear you. So with that in background, I said I should go back and open up the uh, open up a private laboratory. I had the skill of running a clinical laboratory. So it was not, the difficult thing was raising up money to buy the equipment. But with the help of some friends, I managed to get the equipment, came. It took me about six months to get premises. Actually, we started off at where SAS Clinic is currently, okay. uh, Plot 1 Bombo Road. So we opened, and uh, from the time we opened, some of the clinicians, when we put out the list of tests we were doing, many of them were doubting whether we were actually saying the truth. But on testing us, they found that our results were matching the clinical picture. So their thinking was that a Ugandan cannot run such kind of facility privately? At that time, there were very few... I could say there was no laboratory producing genuine results. So they were thinking that oh, this might be, he's, going to, he's also going to sit down and maybe write reports <laughs> like that. <laughs> but we had, had, uh, had worked in very good laboratories mm. and I had got the, what? the, 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 professional, the professional ethics. Mm. So we started giving them the results, sometimes giving them, diverting their uh, opinion from what he was thinking to something else, mm. depending on the results we produced. And uh, they start gaining confidence in us. Okay. So the volume of work kept on increasing. And uh, you know, when I was starting, we ha I had three, st we were, I had two staff plus myself. I had a young man who was working as a cleaner and a messenger, and a young girl who had just finished a secretarial course. She was working as a typist, mm -hmm. a receptionist, and a cashier. And I was doing all the Technical, taking off samples, examining them, reporting them, signing the reports after typing, and uh, giving, uh, getting uh, a type two report was a new thing to the clinicians in Uganda. They were just re used receiving handwritten reports. Handwritten reports. Yeah. Yeah. Little wonder there was a lot of creativity in that yeah. process. <laughs> 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 yes. So Isn't they kept true? on giving us the work. The work kept on increasing. In the laboratory, we have specialties about five major disciplines of specialization. Mm. When we're training, you first train in the, all of them, but uh, you end up in specializing in one. So some of the work we used to come and it was not my specialty. I would go and call on some of the friends. Mm. They would come, do that piece of work for me, make that report, and then they go. But I realized that I could no longer handle it alone. So I invited another colleague who with, with whom we are still with, Mr. Suleiman Moga. Oh. Okay. We were together in training, and he came and he joined me from 1992-93 up to now. We are still wow. together. Mm. So he joined me, and then they were, as the demand increased, the number of staff also increased, both technical and clerical and the nursing staff. 
up to today when we have about 40, 50 staff. Perfect. Now, going back to the, at the beginning, because mm -hmm. I know here you are, you're starting a totally new and different line of business. Even doubted because people said no laboratory results in Uganda can be believed exactly. if it's from a private person. Exactly. Now, mm -hmm. beyond the doubts, mm -hmm. and uh, of course you had to deal with issues of, you know, if someone can go and get a creative diagnosis somewhere <laughs> from, you know, um, what are some of the challenges that you had to contend with at the beginning? Uh, there were many challenges. Getting premises, I told you, it took me six months to get a premise. That is the time when the departed Asian custodian board buildings were being repossessed by the Asians. Mm. And getting somebody out of that building, you had to part with money in terms of goodwill. So that was a challenge. And even in remodeling, refurbishing that build, uh, building the entire structure into a, 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 a laboratory setting. Yeah. Mm. <coughs> At that time, the water was not readily available. You mm. know, sometimes our patients have to use the toilet to get samples. Mm. Electricity mm. was very, mm. very erratic. Mm. That is mm. tough, eh? Mm. Mm. <laughs> uh, even getting the consumables, there were no agents, there were no importers of our laboratory agents. Mm. So I had to, at first I used to go back to Nairobi and purchase from there. Then I realized it was very expensive. I started importing them from South Africa and the UK, which again was very costly because you could maybe make an order of uh, a thousand pounds, but you are paying more than a thousand pounds for the freight, which made it quite expensive. But with the time, as things went on uh, stabilizing, now we have agents, they import in big bulk for everybody, and we can buy locally. And you can even buy on credit because at that time I had to pay cash for the for whatever I needed to to import. To import, and I there was no laboratory mm. to to refer to. Were the only private laboratory, and uh, even in the government hospitals, the services were very basic at that time. Mm. Yeah, I hear you. We will hold it there. Uh, Charles, this is where we, I, I want to bring you in. Uh, mm. You know, um, really mm. humble beginnings and uh, Very. really Very. like breaking the ice. Exactly. Yeah. What do we pick from, you know, this story at that level? The first thing is just imagine and pick Chimba in Nairobi, comfortable with a good salary. Mm. But it's looking at the whole thing and saying, we are all here, we are Ugandans. And Ugandans are coming all the way to Kenya mm. to get the services. So there was that passion about going to support your countrymen. The issue never said, I want to go and make money in Uganda. Yeah. He said, Ugandans are coming here. How can I help my Ugandans? The love, the passion for what you want to do was extremely key. Because there were many other Ugandans who could have done the same, but the others simply said, well, if that is what Uganda is, so be it. We are not going there. We are not sacrificing our lives. Yeah for the sake of a broken economy. So he said, no, I love my Ugandans. Let me go back home. When he comes home, there are issues which you will not get in a business plan. You are looking for premises, but when you get promise premises, did you put in a business plan a provision for a goodwill? You didn't. Did you put in a business plan a provision on how to sort out water? You didn't. No. Now, if you didn't do those things and you are from Western Europe, you just simply say, this is not how to be a technical laboratory uh, expert. I'm leaving this country. He stuck to the game and said, what do I do here? Persistence, resilience. Those words are integral to the journey of an entrepreneur. Mm. But as he was doing that, he also had a few more things that are typical of this journey. And I bring these elements because... I need Ugandans to know that by the time you see a finished product called Ebenezer, this fellow was everything in the beginning. He picked the sample, he went to the micro microscope, he analyzed the microbes, he wrote the report, <laughs> then he handed the report the other side. Yeah. The other two people were low caliber staff. In a business plan, you don't put that there. Yeah. A business plan, a sub would, plan would read, you know, you needed three people. One should be this, one should be this one, and they should have good chairs. They should have all these kind of things. This is the typical journey of an entrepreneur. Very, very interesting. And it's key and key 
for Ugandans to know this kind of things. Mm -hmm. And then he begins to see challenges. You want to do your, rea your testing, the reagents are not available. Is there not the time to fold up and simply say leave? Mm -hmm. He said, no, what do I do? Until he started saying, why don't I start importing? You go to the importing, mm -hmm. the cost of freight for the reagent is higher than the cost mm -hmm. of the real reagent that you are picking. And the jobs in Kenya are waiting for you. Why not pack your bags and go back? That's right. The, it, is, it is really to tell the Ugandans that uh, do not ever imagine that when you pick your NSSF money, after you've been a medical doctor at Mulago, you just go and start a clinic and you start flying. You will be shocked. And the earlier you begin to walk this kind of hurdles, when the salary is still coming, mm. the better. I think it's you, you know, it's push. very interesting when you yeah. mentioned that, the mm. NSSF thing. Yeah. You know, I've had many uh, people that I've interviewed, especially those that are nearing retirement. Retirement, yeah. Or the evenings, as they call them. Yeah. You know, telling you that I want to retire to, and then they drop a name of a, a practice. Yeah. yeah. I want to retire to farming. Yeah. I'm sure you hear that a lot. Very true, very true indeed. Oh, I want to retire into, just run my clinic. Yes. And then you're wondering, do these people know what exactly... Exactly. is entailed in this thing. Because you might find yourself actually working double or triple the Up way you midnight. Yes. But as you even do those things, yes. things you never envisaged yes. have turned up. Yes, absolutely. Which brings me back to you, Mr. Chamber. Um, mm. You know, scientists tend to be a little more comfortable. I'm sorry, I'll try to generalize. Mm. Uh, mm. I, I normally try to avoid that. But um, in most cases, we see you know, scientists are focused if I'm um, in this area, I'm in this field. Mm. We rarely see them making that leap to go into the business world. And I'm sure there are many who are watching you and probably are wondering how did he make that leap? What mm. informed that decision? I know you touched a little about the need back home and that kind of thing. But mm. what was that, you know, spark, that thing that really pushed you and helped you to actually sustain that energy to say, I'm going into private practice, I'm coming back home, and I'm starting my own business. Actually, when I came to start the laboratory, I didn't think of a business. Okay. I, I, no, I was not starting it as a business. <laughs> I was starting it to, an, uh, to, to offer a service, mm -hmm. which I know they would be paying me for that. They would be paying for that service, and that pay collection would keep me going. And uh, my focus was on the service, on the service, other than the money I was making. Mm. So as long as I got enough to pay the rent, to pay my the few stuff I had, and by the way, the first uh, professional person I employed was my wife. She mm. was a nurse. She's a nurse, okay. and so she came in to start taking off the samples. Yeah. So before I started recruiting other staff. Yeah. But after some time, she had to go to another job because we had the children who were still young going to school without putting everything together. If we are all there, if supposing Ebenezer does not fail at some point, the children's education will be at stake. So she joined the JCRC where she is up to today. I hear you. Yeah. Now, um, you s build this clinic into a world-class rather, this laboratory into a world-class facility. Mm -hmm. um, tell us about that journey. How did you now, because, I mean, we all s we've seen so many businesses start here. And, uh, of course, it's now a very old line, but it's still true that many of these businesses won't see even their second or first birthday. Mm -hmm. um, how did you manage to transition now from this small laboratory to now where you are? a uh, globally recognized laboratory? Uh, <coughs> as I said, when we came in, when I came in, I was focusing at offering a laboratory service, a quality that I used to offer in Nairobi Hospital. Mm. So I was focused on that. The money was secondary. And uh, people kept on praising us for the good work we are doing. Both the patients, and the clinicians. Yeah. So we grew very fast to the time when I realized, I used to hear that when, when a business grows up, 
it, when it's at its peak, that's when somebody should withdraw mm. and uh, think of something else. Otherwise, you are going to start a declining phase. Mm. So I feared that. Then as I was talking to my, one of my, colli my colleagues, he told me there is a, we have attended the, a presentation by Enterprise Uganda. They have a program called Expand Your Business. I'm sure you are going to benefit from it. <coughs> they are such a plot, I think. Is it Rumumba Avenue? Yes. So he directed me. I went in. I was welcomed. I explained the actual. I didn't even know what to expect. But just venturing into somebody who can help me. I don't know how he was going to help me because I was not looking for money. Mm. <laughs> mm. <laughs> so the receptionist, that when I explained to her my, what, I want, wh what I am and what I wanted, did I give me Mr. Chiki's office? I explained to Mr. Chichi what, uh, was go what I was going through. He immediately said, ah, you are now suffering from failure to manage success. Mm. <laughs> and I, <laughs> 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 I felt he was very on the point. <laughs> mm. I thought I'd reached the peak. Mm. You had and arrived. Yes. Mm. So he talked to me. I think it took us more than an hour. Then he told me about the expand your expand your business programs, how they are training, three days like that. I immediately enrolled. So the following one, I attended it. By the time I finished the strategic management, marketing, financial management, HR. and human resource, mm. I realized that I was actually, I'd had hardly started my business. Mm. So we started putting in those uh, management skills and uh, after again people continuing continued to appreciate our service then again through one of the training the training we were having with enterprise uganda they talked about international accreditation that was uh, and at that time it was beginning the manufacturers mm -hmm. but the manufacturers manage they do, do there is a a standard called the iso 17 is it 19000 mm, mm. that is for management yeah so we went in for we went in for accreditation we didn't know i didn't know what we were going in for but wanted to get a recognition international co to challenge ourselves to international standards that are these people generally are we genuinely having high quality international mm. level or we have uh, Uganda, we have given Uganda what they have never seen and they think it is the highest. Mm. Mm. So we went in, they managed to identify uh, a consultant for us who was qualified to mentor people into ISO 9000. So we developed the documentation. After developing the documentation, he said, let's uh, organize a launch to tell people that we have decided to go, in to go into accreditation organized uh, a cocktail. It was at the at Shua House, we at the laboratory. We invited in the doctors from Lago, from Makerere, and we also invited people from Uganda National Bureau of Standards. Mm -hmm. When the, he, sa he suggested to invite them, I didn't see the use of the, the, the they, were, they had nothing to do with medical. <laughs> but when they came in, we presented something. Then after the cocktail, one of the people from UNBS called me and said, Mr. Chimba, you have taken a wrong way. You want to go to Masaka, but you are taking Ginger Road. Mm. This is standard they are, you, are, you are preparing for is for management, mm. not for laboratory. And laboratories get accreditation. These other bodies get certification. Mm. So you come to UNBS tomorrow, <laughs> and we show you the right standard. Mm. Yeah. I went, disappointed though, <laughs> yes. because we had invested a lot of time. Yeah. yeah. And uh, the, 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 the consultant was being paid by SIDA, mm. Swedish International Development, Development Agency. Agency. Mm. Mm. So I went, she took me through the, what we were supposed to do. So I said, you have got to go back and develop the documents, but we are going to assist you. Mm. Provided, we are not going to charge you, but provided you can pay our fuel. It was herself and a colleague. So they started, uh, as we were going through the standard, a colleague of hers came in and said, oh, this is a, med a medical laboratory. This is standard does, they have developed a specific standard for medical laboratory. Mm. Then he's taking us back. 
So I said, but it was not different, much different from the the one which for testing laboratories. Mm. They really managed mind to get me a copy. We went through it. Said yes, even this one we shall be able to coach you. So from that, and we were doing work after they had finished their work at five o'clock. They would come in about six o'clock, and they would stay in the lab up to about eleven in the night, mm. writing, make, making the write-ups. Because we again had a time limit. The consultant, to the CIDA had given us a th six months. By the time we did the launch, we had already taken off three months. We had three months to go, develop the documents, start implementing it, mm. and uh, get a, um, there is what they call the pre-inspection visit. They even identified the right institution which could accredit us, which is SANAS, South African National Accreditation System, while the other one was being uh, managed by NEMCO. So they wrote to them, instead of uh, paying for them to come and pre do the pre-inspection, UNBA said, no, we are going to do the what? We shall do the pre-inspection. You don't have to pay money for that. Mm. I was a bit skeptical. Although I didn't know what I wanted, I said, now, will these people be able to take me through to the, when the, uh, the South Africans come here, they, um, they find us fit? Well, I accepted. And uh, we, the South Africans came in, and at that time there were only Wazungus. It, it, uh, the accreditation was just starting everywhere, and uh, being South Africa, what it was, it had uh, it was mainly uh, whites. It is these days that blacks have taken over. Have taken over. Yeah. Mm. So they came in, inspected us. At the end of it, they said, "You are doing very well." Actually, are doing better than even some South African the, camp. They were surprised. Yes, they were surprised. Hold it there, Mr. Chimba. I mm. think I see a very interesting story, Charles, here. Yeah. Mm. Mm. You see a story mm. of passion, Correct. not money, at the beginning. Very true. And then you also see a story of, uh, you know, preparation. Nothing's Correct. happening by accident. Very true. Very true. Yeah. Very, very, very true. And uh, I don't mm. know what you're picking there, but it's quite inspirational there. It is a very, very interesting journey. And these are the kind of things I wish this country could begin to write management books. Here is a man who gets a lot of accolades from patients, from the hospitals, saying, you are doing well. You are doing well. Then he says, I think, you know, this fellow could have remained a small lab and happy to be exactly that. Mm. Until he met a friend who said, where you have reached, I think you can get yourself to grow beyond this. Good enough for him. He was humble enough to listen. Mm. You know, when people are praising you, and then there again, somebody is telling you, please go for further training elsewhere. You almost want to say you don't know what you are saying. <laughs> Do you see all these people here who respect me? Yeah. He was humble. He said, let's go to Enterprise Uganda. Mm. He comes to Enterprise Uganda. He signs up and he discovers a whole new world that opened a floodgate for opportunity to grow the man began to grow afresh. As he's doing that, he's also saying, now that I'm beginning to grow, he says, no more mediocre thinking here. I want international accreditation. Mm. The thing was new. Mm. The thing was costly. Mm. It was consuming his time and his resources. He said, I want it. Along the way, he meets UNBS. Mm. UNBS redirects him. He says, I'll stick to it. I want to say this. It's much more difficult to advise and to counsel and to guide or mentor a successful person. A person who thinks that he has arrived. <laughs> yes. yes. He had the elements to accommodate advice, mm. to accommodate guidance by people in UNBS, mm. by people who are doing business advice or services. That's different. But every person listening to this story, you just need to have that kind of humility to say, I should have room to be advised, to be given guidance. I hear you. Mm. Mr. Chimba, um, yes, in terms of, because we now know you at that level, uh, globally, you run a globally recognized laboratory. Um, just give us an idea of, you know, the kind of recognition you've received globally or um, accreditation yeah. uh, that you've received, you know, um, so that viewers get to know where you are today. Um, 
I don't know whether I got it correct, but uh, we got accredited in 2005. Mm. Uh, that's when we reached the international levels. That made us being recognized by some companies, we, with by some commercial companies which do research. Mm. They could trust their work with us. And uh, we get inspected every year. South African assessors, SANAS sends assessors to come and uh, see whether we are still on track. M yeah, on track. Actually, even currently, they are going to do it, but they are going to do it remotely mm. because of the COVID. We are going to present our documents and then they see whether we are actually maintaining the services. Uh, the Minister of Health recognized us that as, as having the best diagnostic services in the country, I think in 2012. Oh, eight years ago. Yeah. Almost. Mm. Um, recognition, I think that's, but uh, at the beginning, when, when we, in 2005, mm. we were the first medical laboratory to get to attain that accreditation in East Africa and uh, probably in the Great Lakes region. That is powerful. And actually, this is where I bring in this question, because I understand that currently, the number of studies taking place, mm. you know, in your world. Mm. And uh, I want to attach this or anchor this to the Buy Uganda, Build Uganda policy. Mm. And yet we still see quite a number of samples, you know, that are shipped out of the country every day, you know, to labs all over the world. Mm. Um, and I want to ask you as an expert and, and, and uh, a keen co follower of this, if I may call it, sector. Mm. Um, do you feel that as local investors in this line of business, you're well supported? And do you feel as a country we should be shipping, you know, uh, a number of these samples, you know, to the volumes we're actually shipping or we actually have some capacity uh, home that can be utilized better? Uh, first of all, there is no laboratory probably in the world that does all the tests. Yeah. At some point you find that you have to refer some samples to another lab. Okay. Maybe those countries, they don't have to, s to ship them outside their country, but they have to refer to their another lab which is specialized into that line. Mm. In Uganda, okay, we can reduce on the volume of uh, samples that go out, probably if we got government uh, involvement. Mm -hmm. the, what they call the public-private partnership. Yeah. If the government can come up and uh, maybe purchase some of those, uh, the equipment in the laboratory are very expensive. And, and on average, you may part between uh, 70, 150,000 dollars to get wow. an average equipment. But they can even go beyond. Mm. So s such uh, equipment are not easily affordable by individuals. Mm. And some of these tests are not so common. Mm. Actually, most of those that, that are being referred are not so common and quite expensive. You cannot afford to buy a reagent and it would expire on you. Mm. Or else you would charge too much. So it's more convenient to outsource. We call it outsourcing from those laboratories outside other than, and you get it faster. And again, very accurate, because if you are going to do a test once a month, chances are that your reagent is going to expire. You are going to get inaccurate results because you are not doing it every day. Mm. So that's what I think the government, if the government came in to partner with us, they can import the equipment, many equipment actually. And probably Different. even these reagents that are so once in a while used, yeah. government should be stocking them, mm. yeah. saying whenever anybody wants them, they mm -hmm. should now be there. But at the cost of government in case they expire yeah. uh -huh. at the government hands. And we can also pull, mm. we can say, laboratory A, you specialize in this type of tests. You specialize so that all that, that we get, mm. we shall be sending them to you. That can work. Do we have enough, a pool, or what you would call a critical mass of technical people to actually run these labs? Oh, very many. Mm. Very many. And there are again very many outside in those countries. Ugandans, but U operating out. Ugand are operating outside. But because of the facilities at home, mm. 
you are highly specialized and then you come back to start doing rudimentary tests, it's a bit frustrating professionally. I hear. That's why they, they, they stay outside there. Charles, yeah. what do we see here? Interesting. Um, first of all, the, here is a person who knows his limitations mm. and knows that you cannot just continue to do things for the sake of emotions. If the resources cannot permit you to just stock ingredients or reagents that you can only get occasional customer, don't do it. Yeah. And two, he also cites some of the things that could guide government. We spend a lot of money in doing these uh, overseas uh, services. Instead of putting such huge resources abroad, mm. just tell government, talk to the different lab technicians and tell them, which are those reagents that are costing this country money? How can we then get either the National Drug Authority or whoever to just have them available and as and when this expert, because he has confirmed, yeah. the skills are available. Yeah. The people are ready to do a good job, but those reagents will cost them money. Mm. So conversation with the government. Mm. And not ignoring any element of this country, this sector. Mm. Talk to the professor of featuring in the ministry, ministry uh, budgets and conversations. Absolutely. With the, with the, with the Absolutely. The because as process. a country, if we're saying mm. we, because you educate these scientists. Yeah. And you need their service. Yeah. So I think it makes a lot of sense if they are supported, really. Very, very but I pick a very interesting, you know, uh, aspect there, Charles, as we prepare to go for a short break. Mm. Um, you know, managing success and excitement that comes with it. Mm. And someone being humble enough to say, let me look for someone to actually help me yes. move to the next level. I think that is very powerful. Very, very. On that note, viewers, very we're going true. to take a very short commercial break. But I need to remind you that we have a number on your screen. You can send us your WhatsApp, uh, f your comments on WhatsApp and uh, uh, question, comment, and then we'll be able to respond when we come back from this break. Welcome back. Dear viewers, we're still looking at uh, the story of uh, Mr. Chimba. Chimba is the proprietor of Ebenezer Laboratories. And we're looking at how the story of transforming a tiny laboratory into a globally accredited laboratory. Mr. Chimba's business began as a service, as he has already mentioned, a passion for that matter. And then it is now a business that employs many Ugandans and has had impact, uh, not just within Uganda, but across the region. And not mm. just East Africa, but we're talking about Eastern Africa yeah. and probably globally. Because yeah. uh, I'm sure there are many uh, partners and people he's working with mm. around the world. Mm. So very powerful story. And I think this is the point where, again, I will come back to you. Uh, uh, Mr. Chamber, today, as you do your business, mm. uh, because you live and work in an environment, um, what are those realities that you're contending with today in the day-to-day -day operation of your business? And how are you managing to keep afloat? You've already told us how you manage that leap mm. of managing mm. the excitement. Mm. Charles here normally says that uh, it's always a challenge for a business to move from small Mm. to medium very true because at the peak of small someone feels yeah you've you've you've, you've hit it <laughs> they've done it mm. <laughs> now transitioning or transiting yeah. into medium is always a challenge yeah now you're here how are you managing the challenges associated with that space and how, how you are coping with those challenges uh <coughs> some of the challenges is the restocking uh, reagents reagents and b buying equipment is a very big challenge because equipment good equipment is expensive yeah and uh, sometimes they have what they call reagent rental where they they um, they install the equipment in your lab mm. and then they charge you very highly for the consumables which mm. again makes it very difficult mm. for the patients mm. you're out to Mm. Uh, they, 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 you recharge too much to be able to meet to, 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 to make a markup and uh, the another thing is um, staffing yeah because when our staff when we recruit new staff we train them actually 
almost take uh, more than a month retraining them. Whenever there is a job and they, uh, somebody from Ebenezer applies, they always go, they always get the job. Mm. So we have to keep on training. The good thing is that now at first it used to annoy me, but I came to accept it because I cannot stop training and I cannot stop them from leaving. Yeah. So I've come to accept it, what, what, what we say, that when you go out, become our ambassador. Mm. And they have faithfully lived it to that, all those that have trained, to show that they actually appreciate the training they receive from us. I get you. And they, they keep on referring. Me, wherever I go, I will always refer my people here because I know you are doing a genuine work. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. What are some of the turning points that, if, that you can remember that have defined you know, uh, Ebenezer Laboratory and you as uh, a proprietor of this great service? The day when I got in contact with the Enterprise Uganda, mm. it was a big turning point for me because I thought I'd come to the end of the road. The day we obtained the accreditation, it was another very big uh, turning point. I think those are the major ones. Those are the major ones. Mm -hmm. Charles, mm. before we go to the questions, because I have quite a number of WhatsApp uh, questions here that have come through. Yeah. Um, quick ones on the realities and how Mr. Chimba here is handling. Yeah. When a great brand begins to generate success, yeah. what it does, it attracts a lot of good talent. Yeah. That good talent will not necessarily be fully engaged all the time within what you are doing in that great brand. And what happens with that? They tend to become the targets for headhunting by other people within the industry. Yeah. Now, if you are the brand generator, the brand builder, if you do not redefine what success is to you, the departure of such well-trained people could hurt you and stop you from doing the right thing, which is continue building more and multiply as many people to change this country. Mm. Listening to Chimba, he comes up with something that now I want the listeners to know about. What then is success when you are great and you are successful already? Success, if I may put one of the best definitions I've ever read when I, I was doing my, my research, it said, success is when you have been able to transform other people's lives mm. and assisted individuals to realize their own dreams. But as you do those two, you're also having some fun. Yeah. If you can transform people's lives, if you can assist people to realize their, dr their dreams, and you're also having a bit of fun as you're doing all those things, mm. success has come your way. It actually rubs off. It do not try mm. to reduce success to money. Yeah. If you do that, you're going to hurt yourself. Mm. This man will now be a loved man everywhere he's going because love owners, love um, uh, technicians will be saying if it wasn't for the young man we got from Ebenezer, we were going down. Mm -hmm. And that is different. And that is something you can't put money on. Mm. So I think that is what we need to begin to see that Uganda should be seeing a fact that as you build a great name, a great brand, ultimately you should reduce your success to the definition of how much you are making value to people's lives and two, to what extent you are assisting others to get to flowering of their own dreams. Mm -hmm. But also look at the turning points of this man. When he thought that his success had been, it was hitting the ceiling, he goes for training and he discovers, I'm just beginning my journey. And at that point, the big brand name that now is wearing large shoes began to emerge. We could have had some very happy man in some small corner with one stool, with the two staff, all the way for 30 years. But he's happy in that small corner with this one microscope. Mm -hmm. And he'll be making a living. When he discovered that learning is nonstop, he sh started shooting up. Then he goes international because mm -hmm. he says, I've challenged this story called Uganda. Why can't I measure with the very best worldwide? Yeah. And at that point, you now know this person really wants to empty himself before his God says, come home. Beautiful turning points and beautiful choices. Yeah, very beautiful yeah. indeed. Yeah. Now, I, I think this is the point when I go to the questions of the viewers, because yeah. I have a number of them that I've sent through um, yeah. questions. I have one, uh, Daniel Kula. 
is uh, a student of Master of Science Biochemistry in India and is wondering um, how, because he's saying that you realize Uganda today there are sectors producing clinicians year in, year out, and in every district almost. Um, what advice do you have for this young clinician, majorly, to use their skills in running a laboratory business? What kind of counsel would you give them? Mm. First of all, if you are coming into a service providing uh, industry, mm. focus on the quality of the service that you are going to render, other than money. Many people tend to think when you are starting a business, you want to make big profits. Mm. But in a service industry, profits will not come unless people are interested in, your, in what you, the service you are selling to them. So you should focus on the quality of service you offer. And uh, to be able to maintain that, that quality, you have to be interested in what you are doing. And uh, get involved yourself. Mm. Don't just sit in the office and uh, delegate. Mm. I think f there the success will come. Mm. I hear you. Mm. Now I have Taban. Taban is from Juba, South Sudan, and is wondering, he would like to ask uh, you for skills transfer. Does Ebenezer give opportunities for students to do internship? Yes, we do. But somebody has got to book in advance. The demand is too high and we, we don't have enough space. Mm. We only take on one or two. But those who have back, uh, booked at least maybe a semester earlier. Okay. Charles, I know there are some questions that have come your way. Uh, yeah. Please, you can run through them. Yeah, the, just the, 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 the student was saying that clinicians are becoming many. Yeah. What do we do with these young people who are coming in with all these skills and they are looking for opportunity to deliver value to the country? Mm. Number one is what he has just said, that mm. please, as a young clinician, do not wait until a letter saying you have been given an appointment with a job with a title, with a premise or an address for you to, not s to now start saying that's the time you can start giving your, your skills. Mm. Volunteer. Tell somebody with a clinic that please, I am available. Can I be coming whenever you have uh, issues on who can run a lab at particular times? And when you go there, do not go there with a the mindset of saying I'm just a volunteer. Mm. Go there to do outstanding job. People will start saying, by the way, this young man whom we brought in here without even an appointing letter, he has the right attitude. He does the job the way we want. Why don't we give him a, a job? Mm. Knock the next door and <coughs> tell people that you are available <coughs> and you want to offer a good service today to the country. But number two, <coughs> we have uh, successful clinics already available here. One of them is uh, Ebenezer. Why would government not do exactly what we are talking <coughs> about here, where we are saying, let us um, bring in reagents yes. that will begin to make a <coughs> clinic like uh, Ebenezer yeah. to start to offer things that we have been uh, sending the samples outside. Absolutely. <coughs> I so thought about that. Mm. <coughs> I would want to see a situation where we begin to see this country saying, what is it we can do to maximize job opportunities with existing <coughs> laboratories? Mm. It's very, very key. I hear you. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and then um, I, think get for him some water. I think we, um, Excuse me? W when we look at um, a number of uh, questions here, I have someone from, uh, uh, of course, uh, Mbarara who was wondering where the contacts of Enterprise Uganda are. Yes. yes. And how they can get, because I have a number of them also asking, how can they get on the Enterprise Uganda program? It is something that we have received with a lot of uh, humility and a lot of uh, happiness that Ugandans want to know where Enterprise Uganda is and what we do. Mm -hmm. Every challenge that you've been hearing in these Sunday afternoons, Enterprise Uganda has got a package for ensuring that we assist entrepreneurs to overcome some of those challenges. Mm -hmm. So Enterprise Uganda is an enterprise building institution 
and we pick the entrepreneur where you are. If you are at zero, there's a product for that. Mm. If you are micro, there's a product for that. Mm. If you are small, there's a product to make you go from small to medium size. Yeah. If you want to move from medium size to now the way Benessa has done what they have done, mm. we have got products for your internationalization in terms of credentials. Mm in terms of corporate governance, introducing the aspects of uh, the board issues, all these are the kind of product that we give at Enterprise Uganda. Mm -hmm. I will give uh, our landline is 0312 382 100. Mm -hmm. That's the landline and mine is 0772 699808. So mm -hmm. these are the, the contacts you could use to reach Enterprise Uganda, and it will be our pleasure to interact with you. Mm. But also I want to say that um, mm. the Minister of Finance, mm. together with the institution Enterprise Uganda, will continue to use this platform to try and give as much opportunity to Ugandans to see some of these messages as we wait for the country to open. Mm. When the country opens and you start seeing schools opening, Churches opening, Ugandans, please come knocking to Enterprise Uganda. I hear you. We now are I have here to give the solutions. Good, good. Sorry, I have to mm. cut you short because I have yeah. many questions that I think we yeah. can uh, help number. Yeah. Um, before I come to Mr. Chimba, uh, there's one in Mbale. Alex is wondering, how does one prevent staff turnover in business? And what is the best way to deal with influx of customers? You know? Uh, but then, uh, uh, as you answer that, Charles, I have a gentleman from Chigali here who is wondering. Yeah. Um, he's asking a question that I think a number, I've seen it being asked a number of times. <coughs> um, how did you mobilize the funds to start this business? And uh, have you got, do you see government support coming your way in that particular regard? Yes. If I may start with you, Charles, as Mr. Mm. Chiemba comes in later. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Uh, staff turnover is one of the biggest challenges for an uh, employer. And uh, beyond being having staff turnover, there are also issues to do with staff productivity. Mm. So staff will, 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 will be attracted by a few <coughs> things, the work culture of the organization. How do you treat individuals as they come into an organization mm. in terms of systems, in terms of fairness, in terms of opportunity? Number two, staff will also love to be given challenges. They need to grow. So if somebody has been in one particular point for a long time and he feels he's not getting opportunity to grow, that can create a desire to leave and go away. Okay. But there are also issues to do with, um, <coughs> with the, reward, the reward system. To what extent is the reward system directly linked with the contribution of the staff as opposed to the number of the years just the staff has been around? Mm. Because you could easily start getting individuals who are saying, you know what, I've been here for a long time. I'm the one to get a higher salary. But there's somebody who's newer but more productive. If you do not reward that newer and more productive employee, he's going to leave. Mm -hmm. I hear so you. the system, the environment, the way you have that organization <coughs> to make sure that individuals feel there's equity, there's a chance to grow, there's a chance to, 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 to be treated as an individual. Mm -hmm will determine the, w the rate at which you can retain your employees. Perfect. Mm. Mr. Chimba, um, yes. someone is wondering, how did you mobilize the funds to start the business? But then, again, I see about three questions asking me, I want to start a laboratory. Uh, where do I get the machines? How mm. do I do it? Uh, funding, <coughs> most of the starting capital was my savings as I was working in Nairobi Hospital. And I started by, say, sample containers. I would go to the, to the wash up. If you're a black people know where, where, where the, the used items are washed. At that time, we were doing a re recycling a lot. Mm. So I would go to there and uh, see, get those bottles which were going to be thrown away. I would talk to the person in the wash up room to wash them for me, and I should to keep them mm. preparing to get a proper sample sample containers, <coughs> samples like a stool, urine, and uh, I started off by buy with my savings. I would start off with buying small pieces of equipment, 
those which could not, and even some of the reagents that did not expire, things like a staining powder. So when time came for me to, when I actually thought I'd gathered enough momentum to come and start open up the lab, that's when uh, I got a loan from a friend who bought me the equipment. At that time, we started off with the basic equipment. It was a photometer. And uh, as actually, CBC, I'm talking to a professional now, CBC were doing it manually. We just got the auto analyzer later on after we had been in practice. And as I said, with honest, with uh, the, the people get to know, the suppliers get to know you and they trust you. They can give you the equipment and you pay as you work. So that's how I managed. But okay. till now, till now they have trust in us. They can give us equipment and we pay slowly as we continue working. Thank you. Uh, Charles, uh, yeah. someone here is asking, he's a teacher, mm. and he's saying, uh, how can he, you know, uh, let me see, how can teachers make the best out of their profession? Because remember, we are talking about what the skills that people have, the professional skills, and how yeah. they can, you know, transform them or ang mm. their mm. business aspirations Very on good. those skills. Very good. Mm. Uh, we have always said that uh, it is easier for a professional if he does get a business mindset to transform his professional skills into a business. Mm -hmm. Today, teachers must recognize the, the fact that parents are having sleepless nights to get students to get the right grades. If you are a super chemistry teacher, mm -hmm. please, after you've done your best in the school, and in the evenings you've got one or two hours, get away that parent will either bring the child for extra support, or you get where the parent is with a few students and start giving those skills. In other words, do not wait until you have got enough resources to start a school, mm. to start running uh, a school business. You start it where you are. Those who do not know the story of Muyingo, mm. they don't know that Muyingo started his first teaching in his sitting room. And for another three years, he had no center called Seta High School. Mm. He now hired a neighboring building that was free and was in a swamp. And people could not pay good rent for it. The owner said, Mualimu, use my place for coaching your students. Today we are talking of a super school with m three campuses. Mm. So teachers need to know that, one, <coughs> we love your services. Two, for us to buy your services and to reward you, build a profile where you are currently teaching. Mm -hmm. Become the best teacher in a particular school. We'll look for you. Good. We'll look for you. Good, good. Mr. Mm -hmm. Chimba, I come back to you. There's mm -hmm. someone here who's wondering. Uh, he wants to pick your mind as an expert in this area. He's wondering, can some of these reagents or stock consumables be manufactured here at reduce on importation? Is it possible? It is possible. <coughs> but actually, that's what we used to do in the old days. But today, most of the equipment manufacturers, they want to, to sell you the consumables as well. So when you decide to make your own reagent, then he's not responsible for the quality of work that is coming out of the machine. So at the moment, you may not be able to, to do that. Mm. Yeah. Then maybe another one is wondering how they can be able to stop laboratories from giving fake results. It seems there's still <laughs> some creative <laughs> Ugandans. <coughs> I think that one goes to the Association of Medical Labor Technologists, the professional body, mm. working together with the Allied Health Professionals Council. That's their responsibility. Mm. Mm. Yeah. But I, I think it's important for now the public to know that such mm. a body exists. Yeah. So that when they, they get to a point where these results have, res have ended up him getting wrong drugs mm. for toxicity of his body mm. and delaying the correct treatment and hence making his situation worse. They should know that there's an association they that, could that pursue is, that is to, doing that. To, to, to punish <coughs> or to correct ab such ab a conduct. Absolutely. Yeah. Now I have someone from Barara. He's running a private laboratory service mm -hmm. and he's saying they've done everything they're supposed to do. I, I think they've been in operation for three years and they've not broken even. He's wow. actually saying they're looking for a mentor wow. who can <laughs> mentor them. I think I'll give you the details.
Interesting. Uh, I would like to keep their identity private at the moment. Okay. Very good. But I think uh, talking about mentorship, I think Charles really that is quite quite a strong point. I don't know. And in fact, the submission <coughs> from that Barak uh, uh, professional is a very good one, because I normally tell people that if you are in a particular kind of a business and you are having a certain issue, pause a bit and ask yourself: Are you the only one having that issue? If mm -hmm. others are running clinics, laboratories and the laboratories are turning a bit of a profit, there is something you must fix. And in our training, we tell them, can you find out what we call the key success factor to be a profitable laboratory? There are key success factors. And if you went and talked to people like Ebenezer and just had a lunch with him, he would discover that as a man is talking, you begin to see these are the number one, two, three, four key success factors that I had omitted. Mm. But for us as Enterprise Uganda, we take you through the philosophy and the concept on how to establish mm. the key success factors for your type of a business. Okay. Once we have taken you through that, you now can go and talk with Ebenezer mm. and you'll pick out everything without any big deal. Very perfect. I have someone who uh, <coughs> is also running a laboratory. It looks like the number of uh, scientists yes, watching. Yes, we have been having mm. issues. Which is and very, very watching. interesting. <laughs> is, uh, his lab is called BioCore. He's mm. a young man called Kenneth Yugunga. Mm -hmm. And he's saying accreditation in laboratory business is very important. And he's actually cheering you up and uh, commending you for those mm -hmm. great milestones and being a source of inspiration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, let's come back here. Um, and I want to reassure viewers that all the questions you send through will find time and have them answered. We'll keep the discussion on. Yes. Even after the show, even mm -hmm. during the course of the week. If you have any burning issue, yeah. you can raise it through that number. You'll get that response come through. Mr. Chimba, many a time, <coughs> and I'm sure you could be, you know, having people who just look at you today, they are looking at what you have and where you've reached, and they're saying this man is lucky. <laughs> Would you define your journey mm. as <laughs> just grounded on luck? Uh, I, okay, maybe there is a bit of luck, because okay. there are very many people who do things and they don't succeed. Yeah. So I was lucky that the effort I put in, uh, I've ripped out of it. But it involves a lot of dedication in what you are doing. First of all, you should know, you should have the skill. Actually, all professionals should have the skill of, uh, and ethics <coughs> of what your professional demands. And then you put in the effort, get involved yourself. Don't delegate everything. Even what you have delegated, make sure that you follow it up to make sure that it's done to the, to the level that you feel you are satisfied that if you are the customer, if you are the receiving end, <coughs> you would go away a satisfied person. Mm. So I think there, if you put in all that effort, luck will come. I hear you. Charles, mm. um, it's a combination of luck and preparation and effort and hard mm. work. Mm. Mm. What can our viewers really get out of this? I think he has put it well. He says that um, the moment you are on the journey and moving and trying to do something, forces from all directions tend to converge where they sweat. Mm. And where they sweat, they will be reward. And so some of those who are very religious... Um, there is a saying which says that to he who has, more, more should be given. <laughs> and to he who doesn't have anything <coughs> and just simply seated at home and saying, maybe I'm not a lucky person, <laughs> even the little you have, we'll go. it should be removed. Yes. But he has put it so well, he said, hard work, dedication, mm. taking a hundred percent responsibility, even for the delegated jobs. Mm. You delegated, but you are, you are in charge. Mm. You delegated for somebody to go and deliver results to a particular hospital. He has delayed to take those. He don't start saying, it was Joseph. Me, I was here, I was actually here, I would have brought them, but it was Joseph. Take responsibility 100%. Yeah. That is not just luck. That is a mindset of a <coughs> visionary. A mindset of sales. I define my success by saying, am I transforming people's lives? Mm. Am I building people's dreams? So luck finds you on that journey and rides on a great mindset. I hear you.
and maybe Mr. Prof Chamber. Mm. professional ethics, mm -hmm. Mm. which has uh, dwindled in many of the professions today. So professional ethics is very, very important. Yes. And that's how you'll win the, you'll win the trust of your customers. Very good. Keyword. Very good. Um, dear viewers, that's all we've had time for uh, this evening. Um, we are committed to bring as many people as possible and from as diverse you know, uh, backgrounds as we can do because we know that different people are sitting in different sectors. We have capacity and profession skills in different areas. So Enterprise Uganda with its partners and NTV, we're committed to bring you these stories and help you really realize <coughs> that potential in you. And of course, not everyone can be a business person. Mm. But there are many people that can be and have not actually yeah. brought those, uh, you know, that potential to the fore to actually see the fruits that come out of that. Mm. Mr. Chimba, thank you for your time. Thank you for being with us. You're welcome. And sir. Charles, thank you as always. I've been your host, Charles Boji. I'd like to wish you a very good evening. Thank you. And